I have the, the honor and the privilege of introducing Dr. Roy Finkenbein. So Roy is a professor of history and the director of the Black Abolitionist Archive at the University of Detroit Mary. He's also a uh, longstanding member of the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. He received his PhD from Bowling Green State University in 1982, and while on the editorial staff of the Black Abolitionist Papers Project at Florida State University in the 1980s and 1990s, he co-edited the five-volume Black Abolitionist uh, and Papers um, uh, from 1830 to 1865, and also um, the Witness for Freedom, African American Voices on Race, Slavery, and Emancipation. And he's also the author of Sources of the African American Past um, with editions in 1997 and the second edition in 2004. And uh, he's also authored dozens of articles and uh, book chapters on the black abolitionists and the Underground Railroad. So he's consulted on museum exhibits, on uh, documentary films and television programs on the Underground Railroad. And he's currently writing a book on the freedom seekers in Indian country uh, crossings and sanctuaries. So. Um, let's welcome Roy Finkenbein as he talks about an Odawa tale about Michigan's Underground Railroad. Getting old is fun. I woke up about a month ago to find that something had taken home in my back that was uh, causing some problems, which is why this week I have an MRI and an e EMG and probably other things going on. Um, I wanted to, uh, before I got to my talk, actually do a quick announcement that ties in with a presentation we heard right before lunch. Uh, Michael Pierce, who's a historian at the University of Arkansas, who I got to know over the last so many months and actually did a webinar with this summer on the Nelson Hackett case. I was talking about the Colored uh, Vigilant Committee uh, part of that. Um, sent me a notice a couple weeks ago that they have gotten a uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, K-12 through Teachers Institute grant and they will be doing one this summer on Nelson Hackett and the Underground Road. Uh, and if there are K-12 teachers here or you know K-12 teachers, let them know that if they want to spend uh, you know, a few weeks in sunny Arkansas learning more about Nelson Hackett and the Underground Road, uh, this is a great opportunity and some ways to weave things into their classes. Um, as was hinted at by uh, Amanda. I'm in the midst of a book that I never expected to be working on. Um, it's called, depending on which side of the bed I wake up on, The Indigenous Underground Railroad or Freedom Seekers in Indian Country. And what you're gonna hear today is a, uh, a, a chapter of it and uh, what I've titled this is an Odawa tale about Michigan's Underground Railroad. And I'm just going to let you guys control it. And if you, you know, put it on a slideshow, and I'll just tell you when to advance it, there's not a ton of slides. Um, Chief Blackskin faced a dilemma. 20 freedom seekers from the South, most likely Kentucky, appeared at his Odawa or Ottawa village on the Grand River near the, today the rapids of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and were seeking help in getting to Canada. Slave catchers had been spotted in the vicinity. After lengthy discussions, the uh, elders of the village, including, um, including Chief Blackskin, decided that they would try to carve out a whole new route to freedom for these 20 people. Blackskin, or Makatosha, 
was the village chieftain. He was tall, he was handsome, and in colder weather he wore a beautiful black coat made of black squirrel skins, and his striking appearance in this coat earned him his name. Blackskin was a forceful opponent both of white expansionism and of acculturation to white ways. For example, when a Baptist mission nearby built a blacksmith shop, Blackskin's band burned it to the ground. Next slide, please. Blackskin's village lay at the dividing line between Indian country and white settlement. The village of about 300 inhabitants thrived as a trading center and was surrounded by vast fields of corn. But white settlement threatened to upset this prosperity. The Treaty of Chicago in 1821 had opened white settlement up to the Grand River, and in 1833, large numbers of white settlers began to appear on its southern banks. What you see here is an 1831 drawing done at Grand Rapids and owned by the Grand Rapids Public Library uh, of the location very, very close to uh, Blackskin's village. There had long been discussions of the village longhouse about slavery in the South, and a fear that American expansionism might make that the lot of Odawa people. After a long debate, Blackskin and the other elders determined to help the 20 freedom seekers go northward to freedom by way of northern Michigan and the Upper Peninsula, and then crossing into Canada from there. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is a map which shows uh, the uh, location. You see South Ottawa Village. Many of you can locate that. Um, obviously, the Grand River. Uh, there was a North Ottawa vi Village, and they had two very different approaches to uh, acculturation to white ways. Uh, the South Ottawa or Odawa village, Chief Blackskin's village, was very anti-acculturation, wanted to hang on to traditional ways, was opposed to conversion to Christianity, but found the Catholic mission nearby a lot easier to work with and a lot less aggressive culturally and otherwise. The North Ottawa village um, which is right in the heart, as you see there, of the rapids uh, in, the, in the Grand River. Um, near the downtown campus of Grand Valley today, for those of you that know Grand Rapids at all. Um, they were much more accommodating, willing to acculturate, willing to convert, welcomed, you see the Thomas mission, the Baptist mission that was there. And so as a, uh, as a result, two very, very different approaches um, here. Let me see the next slide, please. Here's a slide, uh, my attempt, based on all the available evidence I can get, to show the movement of these freedom seekers northward with Odawa help uh, uh, in this uh, journey that I'm going to talk about in uh, picking out tidbits from the evidence, including the oral evidence that I'm going to uh, be talking about to suggest the route they took up to Mackinac. Um, one of the things we know is Chief Blackskin and the Odawa elders at the South Odawa village decided it wasn't safe at the time to send the freedom seekers to Canada via the Detroit River borderland. Um, like many oral traditions, there is no date given. But I'm pretty certain, based on the oral tradition and a number of other sources I've looked at, that this is the fall of 1833. We know it's the fall, uh, and it's likely 1833 because of several reasons. One, the Blackburn riot we heard about this morning had made it unsafe 
to send freedom seekers to Detroit for a time. Blacks were being driven out of the city. Slave catchers were seen again and again on the riverbanks and in the city. And unless uh, we think that Native Americans in the 1830s were getting the news, they were picking it up through traders. Uh, some were literate. Uh, they were getting it in a variety of ways, and they had heard that Detroit was not the place to send people. Um, as I'm also going to talk about later, a key figure in the provenance of this oral tradition um, said it occurred right before he became an adult, and he would have become an adult just shortly after this time. Uh, family that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Thirdly, the freedom seekers, based on other bits of evidence we have, don't seem to have arrived in sizable numbers in southwest Michigan until the early 1830s. And you look at places like Cass County, Kalamazoo, and other places, and that's when we first start to get indications of people turning up. Also, it had to happen before the 1835 smallpox epidemic decimated these Ottawa villages on the Grand River and the 1836 Treaty of Washington, which led to their removal. By 1838, there was no evidence left of these villages. Um, Blackskin sent messengers to Odawa villages in the north of the Lower Peninsula, to the villages at Little Traverse Bay, to send uh, men to accompany the freedom seekers northward. Ten men ultimately came to Blackskin's village on the Grand River from the villages at Little Traverse Bay and Burt Lake, which is to the east of Little Traverse Bay. They then took the trail northward, northwestward, excuse me, um, to uh, Lake Michigan, and then followed through a series of Odawa villages that you can see along the eastern shore of Lake Michigan skirting around and probably making contact with villages at Grand Traverse Bay, Little Traverse Bay, and ultimately to the point of the Lower Peninsula uh, at the Mackinac Straits. The site that they ended up going to on the Mackinac Straits was a frequent meeting place for councils of the chiefs of the Three Fires, or the Ashinaabe. Uh, nations, the Odawa, the Ojibwa, and Potawatomi. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. And this is an 1842 uh, a drawing of that, uh, roughly that location um, on the Mackinac Straits. We know these 10 men escorted the 20 freedom seekers some 300 miles. One of the bits of information we get from the oral tradition as well is along the way, the 10 Odawa men taught the freedom seekers a Native American method of fast walking called wapton. I'm going to work on learning that in the days ahead. Um, they then handed the freedom seekers off to a group of Ojibwa who met them there by prearrangement. Next slide, please. You see this little jog in the Upper Peninsula. First, I want to start by saying there are Ojibwa escorts who they just met for the first time. Um, then placed the frightened freedom seekers, 20 in, in all, in three eight-man war canoes and rowed them into the darkness uh, across the Mackinac Strait, the five miles to the other side of the strait. Um, I tried to put myself, to the extent I can, try to put yourself in the mindset of someone who's running away to freedom They've just been handed on by their captors who they'd gotten to know on this trip to people they'd never met before who said, we're going to take you out into the darkness in these war canoes, and we'll be fine. We'll get to the other side. I'm like, a little bit of faith involved in that process. <laughs> um, after resting in what is today St. Ignace, uh, the group walked about 60 miles overland through the eastern part of Michigan's Upper Peninsula to Nibish Island, um, and Nibish is the one in the tan, right up against Ontario, right above the red line. 
Nebish is Canadian property. Some of the other islands, as you can see, in Lake Huron, American uh, uh, claimed land. Uh, about 60 miles, and ultimately in canoes again, and over into what was then called Upper Canada, but today we would call Central Ontario. Probably more than any other Native American group across the Upper Great Lakes region, the Ojibwa had a close relationship with African American freedom seekers who reached their part of Indian country, including those in northern Michigan and Upper Canada. This included both offering them sanctuary, in other words, welcoming them into their villages, and assisting with crossings to Canada. Evidence of extensive intermarriage of African American and Ojibwa uh, and incorporation, incorporation of African American into Ojibwa villages, uh, there's, a, there's a good bit of that evidence. Uh, it ranges from fur traders like George Bonga, who's fairly well known, to freedom seekers on the run. Reuben Black Cloud, a contemporary Ojibwa oral historian, says the following. Quote, I have heard that we used to do it, take slaves into the tribe. When slaves came in from down south, we took them in also. Slaves come up through Ohio, and Ojibwa would give them a home, allow them to live with us. They got wives from our tribe, unquote. Well, my own interviews with Ojibwa families in northern Michigan uh, one of the great things about uh, uh, doing a project like this now is even in the midst of COVID, I had hundreds of virtual <laughs> interviews with Ojibwa in Ontario and in northern Michigan and some whose family had come from northern Michigan now in other states uh, in the midst of COVID and got valuable information that one, even pre-COVID, much of which I wouldn't have gotten from archives. Uh, but secondly, uh, it didn't slow down the process and uh, in fact enhanced it in some ways. If I could the next slide, please. Um, one, of, one of the things that I found fascinating as I tried to make this African-American Ojibwe connection is to look at some of the scientific slash DNA evidence. Various researchers, here's one, uh, Clyde Winters, who looked at a lot of the DNA research found that high uh, percentages of Ojibwa, almost 9 out of 10, have the RM173Y chromosome. Now, why is it important that they have it? Well, it doesn't turn up amongst Native Americans west of the Mississippi, except those that had been forced to migrate during the removal era. It doesn't turn up amongst their Siberian forebears. It turns up in very low rates among um, people uh, primarily of Euro-American descent. It turns up in very high numbers amongst sub-Saharan African populations. And what, what uh, Winters also found, if you start matching up indigenous nations that we know have substantial interaction with African Americans, particularly runaway slaves, they have the highest. For instance, the Seminole in Florida and then Oklahoma, you know, about the black Seminole, they have very high, uh, very high rates of this chromosome. Uh, some of the other Eastern uh, Native American populations we know have a lot of interaction have very high rates. Ojibwe are number one, 89% of Ojibwa, people who identify as Ojibwa, have this chromosome, which is primarily a sub-Saharan African uh, marker. Um, so there's a lot of interesting ways to get at this, and, and I, you know, earlier when Paul Clements was up here, he was talking about you know, archival research and there are ways to go beyond the traditions. I've been forced to go beyond traditional sources, given the nature of the fact that both the time these things were occurring, both freedom seekers and Native Americans who helped them in one way or another were primarily oral cultures. Um, the Underground Railroad itself, 
as we've talked about, uh, makes the nature of evidence scanty, to say the least, in many cases, and add to it the, the components of working from oral cultures. And so things like oral tradition and DNA evidence can give us some leads. Native Americans in the Upper Great Lakes region felt a sense of kinship with the freedom seekers they encountered, often referring to them as, quote, brothers or, quote, cousins. Ojibwa Methodist missionary John Hall, for example, told African American audiences after the Civil War that, quote, old Indians used to call colored men cousins, unquote. This usually came from an awareness of common suffering at the hands of white settlement and expansion. Hall observed that, quote, Indians are poor just like blacks are, and we stand on one platform. We have suffered just the same, unquote. Next slide, please. This is Peter Jones. Peter Jones, a convert to Methodism and an Ojibwa who ultimately becomes a missionary, believed that the Native American, quote, comes next to the Negro in the endurance of wrongs inflicted by the white man. Jones claimed that antebellum Ojibwa referred to freedom seekers as, quote, our fellow suffering brethren. As a result, they, quote, deeply, in quotes, deeply commiserated with their plight. A particular reason for Native American assistance to freedom seekers reaching antebellum Michigan seems to be a growing indigenous concern with slavery in the South. We often don't think of the kind of the anti-slavery awareness and sentiments of Native Americans, particularly in the Upper Great Lakes region, but it existed. Um, historian Arvin Smallwood has noted that, quote, as slavery spread over and, uh, westward and the cruelty of slavery became known among Native Americans, many began to sympathize with African Americans and despise the institution of slavery. Many Indian nations began to harbor runaway slaves, unquote. Again, Jones claimed that a major reason for Ojibwa hospitality towards African Americans was, quote, their unhappy state in being bound with the iron band of slavery, unquote. Well, let me have the next slide, please. Um, I actually, on my, on my uh, uh, thumb drive, added uh, an arrow in place of the hastily contrived circle, uh, but uh, it does the job. Um, and uh, what you see there is the largest of these islands in the chain that comes kind of southeastward from the Sioux, uh, Sioux St. Marie, into eastern Lake Huron. And the area that is circled in, and is in tan, Canadian uh, territory. Uh, and it is something I want to talk about, and that's Manitoulin Island. Uh, according to Ojibwa accounts, once the freedom seekers crossed into Canada, they were, quote, greatly elated and relieved. What happened to them after that is open to conjecture. Ojibwa I've interviewed suggests that they probably ended up on Manitoulin Island, an Odawa homeland, and after 1836, an Ojibwa reserve as well, uh, by order of the Canadian authorities. Uh, what I've found relatively recently in the last few months as well is that in the early 30s, uh, seeing greater and greater use by the Odawa uh, who were uh, frequently moving different parts of the year, uh, sometimes year to year, but frequently several different parts of the year based on uh, crop cycles, hunting, et cetera, hunting seasons, a whole range of things, uh, had been making that trip up the western uh, side of Michigan's lower peninsula, the eastern shore of Lake Michigan, across to the upper peninsula and into central Ontario and heading to Manitoulin Island. 
So the, f the notion they would do this with freedom seekers uh, that they are trying to assist is pretty reasonable. But as I said, Ojibwa I've interviewed suggest they probably ended up on An uh, Manitoulin Island. There were black Indians who lived on the island for a time, most certainly the product of freedom seekers and Native Americans who intermingled in these mixed communities. And contemporary indigenous scholars uh, in Canada uh, that I've consulted talk about the existence of black Ojibwa even today in central Ontario. Next slide, you got it, thank you. Um, you read my mind. <laughs> um, this particular crossing story comes to us by virtue of Odawa oral tradition and other oral traditions. It was passed down through three generations of an Odawa family called the Miksabes, M-I-C-K-S-A-W-B-A-Y-S. This uh, picture is of Louis Miksabe, born circa 1813, 1814. His father was one of the 10 who accompanied the free, these 20 freedom seekers on this northward journey in probably the fall of 1833. Um, he was coming of age just at the time of this 1833 crossing, which would fit the information in the oral tradition. He told the story frequently I mean, his father experienced it, but obviously told the son. And Lewis told the story frequently. You see him here as a very, very old man in this photograph, which is actually held by the library up in Char uh, Charlevoix. Uh, he then passed the story along to his son, John McSabe, who in official documents it has an anglicized last name, M-C, small c, S-A-U-B-Y. So like he's Irish. He's <laughs> yeah. um, but he used to tell the story uh, for decades to regale uh, Native American friends. And um, one of the places he told this is at unlicensed barberships, barber shops on p back porches in the Hungry Hollow section of Petoskey during the 1930s. This was the Indian section of Petoskey. Uh, you know, no TVs, no internet. People told stories. They gathered on back porches, and the local unlicensed barber, Native American barber, had the only radio in the community. And so this made an ideal place for people to go, and they told stories. And John McSabe and his wife would show up on occasion and tell this tale. Here, uh, Odawa storyteller William Dunlop, or Bill Dunlop, heard the tale. If I could see the next slide, please. This is Bill Dunlop, a World War II veteran, as you note in the cap. He heard the tale from John McSabe, worked it into his repertoire, and told it again and again to Odawa and Ojibwa audiences. Um, in the early 2000s, he began working with a Chippewa writer and artist named Martin... Uh, Marsha Fountain Blackledge. And Marsha Fountain Blackledge, this writer, teased a number of stories out of him uh, that he had told in Hungry Hollow. One was this tale of help, helping freedom seekers. Um, eventually, this was published in 2004 uh, in a book that actually was a notable Michigan history book. Uh, the Indians of Hungry Hollow. Um, well, how do you confirm an oral tale? Uh, one, this is confirmed by a number of Ojibwe sources. Um, Dunlop, for example, found that when he talked to Ojibwe storytellers, storytellers, they knew the tale from their perspective. And uh, John Miskakaman, an Ojibwe storyteller he encountered, told the, and told the tale frequently said his grandfather was one of the Ojibwa who led the freedom seekers across the Upper Peninsula to Canada. I myself have interviewed Ojibwa um, families in northern, northern Michigan whose family oral traditions talk at length of leading freedom, their ancestors, leading freedom seekers across the UP to up central Ontario. Uh, 
It's also confirmed by other Odawa. Marsha Fountain Blackledge, in putting this book together, found the best way to tease the stories out of Bill Dunlop was to provide him with a free breakfast. And so at least weekly, they would meet at the local IHOP in Grand Rapids where he lived. And he would show up with a number of other Odawa elders expecting a free breakfast. Um, but these other elders would pass along details as well that they could add to the story. And uh, while that's not, didn't make it into the telling of the tale, because this was Bill Dunlop's story, uh, she, she has those notes and has been kind enough to share some of that information with me. Um, when the book came out in 2004, Marsha Fountain Blackledge went on a little book tour in Michigan. And one of the things that happened to her after uh, one of these speaking events blew her mind. A young African American woman walked up and said, we tell this story in my family one of my ancestors was one of those people. So there's, there's an established provenance, I argue, for this tale, even though oral tradition. Well, what is this Odawa and Ojibwa oral tradition document? I argue that the Underground Railroad in Michigan was much more complex than we usually think it to be and talk about it being. And just a couple of the complexities. One, we have to start to acknowledge significant Native American involvement in what has been primarily a story of well-meaning whites helping anonymous blacks. Secondly, it involved more than the, just, just the Detroit River borderland and lake steamers. Thanks to Native Americans, some freedom seekers made it to Canada via what I've increasingly dubbed for my own purposes as a northern door that made use of the Upper Peninsula. I hope this provokes some thoughts, and I thank you for uh, listening to this, and I'd be glad to try to answer briefly uh, a question or two. And I'm going to ask you to put up the next slide because that is contact information. Uh, Sharon. High percentage of African blood in the Native Americans on that particular part mm -hmm. of Michigan. And I watch a lot of public television, watch a lot of documentaries. Mm -hmm. Was watching this one documentary where they're talking about the, uh, the copper mines, mm -hmm. and I think they're on that section where, oh, they're, oh, thank you. They're in that section where you showed where the, the trail was, where they're going up to um, um, the northern part. Mm -hmm. And according to this documentary, these ancient copper mines, and we're, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago, so long, long before even Europeans came to America, and especially in this part of America, supposedly they had found this copper, which I guess copper has a certain quality, and they, can, they know where it comes from because of the quality in the, in the copper. But anyhow, they found the copper from Michigan in Africa. So to me, that shows that there was some kind of trade between these native people in Michigan and the Africans hundreds of years before the Europeans even came here and before the Africans were brought here as enslaved people. So perhaps the early, early, early mixing of these, these people is why the percentage of the DNA is so high, because it had you know, longer time to circulate amongst the people. And that's... Uh you know, that's a question that kind of gives us pause, and we have a lot more work to do both on that end and this end. Um, I, I, I do find somewhat suggestive the fact that the, the Native American nations that had the most track record in helping 
freedom seekers seem to be the ones, though, with the highest DNA all across the eastern United States. And um, we do know in the case of Odawa, a lot of intermarriage, a lot of intermarriage in the 19th century. So uh, we've, we've got some evidence in that regard. I think what you suggest is, is something we can pursue further as well. Yes? Mm -hmm. Would you, sorry, thanks. Would you anticipate that you might find leads or information? Do you, do you think that these um, Odawa of Sistine Freedom Seeker folks are, are working through the fort or do you think they're avoiding the fort? Or do you think that there would be anything in those resources there or do you think that they would be staying clear? I think in cases like this, they were probably in the 19th century avoiding the fort for this, these illegal purposes. But there was a lot of trade between Odawa and Ojibwa up in the Mackinac region and the fort. I mean, it's, a, it's an out-of-the-way place in many ways, and uh, they depended on, on Native American trade goods and so forth for part of their sustenance, and et cetera. Is there any evidence that the freedom seekers influenced um, the culture of the Adawa? Any um, artifacts or you know objects of art that were excavated that might um, reflect that distinct culture? Well, I think uh, there's been some work that suggests that some, for instance, musical influence, um, and that's something I'm pursuing further. Other you know uh, musicologists. Have, have looked at some of that, for instance, with the Ojibwa. Um, I would add that, you know, uh, in addition to the, in addition to the uh, anti-slavery sentiment that apparently is making its way into Native Americans east of the Mississippi River, there are also what we might call more self-serving reasons that complement these. And they're logical ones that we know from Native American history. First of all, in, in what today we call the Midwest or the Old Northwest, um, these populations are undergoing population decline. For instance, one of the most active villages in helping freedom seekers get northward to the Detroit River borderland was Chief Kinjuano's village on the Maumee River down in Ohio. In the 1820s, by all best guesstimates, it lost half of its Native American population. A majority of freedom seekers were young males. They get blended into villages like Chief Kinjuanos as ways to keep the bloodline going. It's simple as that. So I, I, not that I'm saying is one that's happening to the exclusion of the other. I'm, I'm saying that anti-slavery and a need to continue the bloodlines can, uh, can go hand in hand. Um, freedom seekers might bring literacy uh, occasionally. They might bring new seeds. They might bring new technologies if it's a craftsman from the South. Um, they, uh, they can add hands that can hoe those giant fields of corn, <laughs> you know, a workforce. So I think there's a, there's a mix of reasons, but clearly a, an anti-slavery concern that fuels underground rural activity is, is part of it. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of questions to be answered. I, I, quite frankly, in this book, which is eight case studies that kind of cover the Midwest, in some ways I'm raising more questions than I'm, I'm answering, <laughs> but I'm getting into sources that it amazes me people haven't explored before or they've explored them, but they haven't looked at them as evidence of Native American involvement because they've been looking for something else. That's why we have to go back again, and, you know, Jamon, you know this, go back again and again to the same source because you might see something different. I think she has. Yep. And is this the last question, Angela? Yeah. It's probably going to be the last question. It's yeah. just a statement. My uh, Canadian cousin has documented it, our uh, Ojibwe uh, connection. Our second great grandfather was. Uh, Ojibwe. Okay, I'm going to have to get your contact information <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, a, I, you know, I have a terrible s 
scavenger of Google, and I've come across some interesting people who have put on Google that they are proud, you know, uh, X generation freedom seekers of both Ojibwa and African American ancestry. I'm like, yay, they don't know it, but they're getting a call from me. <laughs> and people have been so gracious uh, in, in responding, and I've had some of my best interviews from people who aren't historians, not even oral historians, but they're part of families that have passed this down in their tradition. And that's really some of the best stuff. Thank you very much.